evolution by natural selection. This is an idea that has been sought after since the dawn of human thought. And it was a theory that was discovered by two people, and we've blithely forgotten one of them. What on earth has happened to poor old Alfred Russell Wallace? Alfred Russell Wallace was born in 1823 in a, a small cottage by the banks of the River Usk in Wales. And he works with his brother and they're surveying the British countryside. He becomes interested in plants. And this is Britain. There's not even that much to become interested in. I say that with a certain amount of national pride. And in 1844, he meets Henry Walter Bates. Bates turned out to be a really keen beetle collector. So, okay, here we are collecting beetles in miserable Britain. We can do better than this. We can do real science. He suggested to Bates that they both go off to Brazil and collect mainly insects, but also birds. These are two know-nothings. If they don't have any money, they've been nowhere, and they decide to go to the tropics. I mean, this was like, this is the equivalent today of going to Mars. It's just so unimaginably bold. They headed off to Brazil, worked together for a while, and then decided to split up and concentrate on different areas of the Amazon. Wallace was the modern equivalent of a backpacker. Basically traveling by himself, he's dependent upon local help, everything's stuffed into a dugout canoe, and yet he's trying to do science. And collecting stuff, which is the worst kind of science to do under those circumstances, because you're just accumulating enormous amounts of stuff. Spider monkeys, toucans, parrots, Fantastic, gaudy things. So he has this vision. He's going to walk into a London scientific salon with a toucan on his arm. He's not going to be a nobody, he's going to be a somebody. What happened next was that 26 days into the voyage, when the, the ship was kind of in the middle of the Atlantic, it caught fire. Ships on fire, it's going up like a tinderbox. And they watched the ship sink. Wallace got to visualize the collections which he'd nearly died for, those living animals, those pets that were his passport to the big time. He watches everything go up, literally, in flames. Ten days later, they were very luckily rescued by an old leaky ship that was going back to England. And he writes this poignant letter, as one would. <laughs> it's nice to be back. I'm never going to see again. But if he wants to realize that ambition to become, quote, a scientist, he's got to do it again. Wallace decided, where next? He's off again, this time to Southeast Asia. He collected an astonishing total of 126,000 specimens of natural history. And out of all the specimens he collected, several thousand were new to science. He's doing the backpacker thing again. He's, he's struggling to survive. He's getting attacked by insects. His specimens keep getting stolen by dogs. And yet he's still finding time in between bouts of malaria to really think big picture. He was in a, a little uh, village, you know, racked by malarial fits. During this illness, Wallace was really thinking about natural history and the distribution of plants and animals in space and time. The notion was that species changed one into another through time. And for whatever reason, ping, yes, there was his eureka moment. Wallace realized uh, basically there's constant death and a struggle in the, the natural world. There's finite resources, therefore a competition. So who's going to win that competition? Well, the best endowed. And this provided a mechanism driving evolution, natural selection. If you want a eureka moment, that's pretty eureka -y. Famously, as soon as he's capable of holding a pen, 
He writes out his manuscript. Because he knew that Charles Darwin was interested in evolution, he posted the scientific essay off to Darwin. When Darwin opened Wallace's essay and started to read it, he was absolutely shocked. Darwin wrote, Wallace could have seen one of my manuscript and used its chapter headings as his topic sentences. Darwin cobbles together a set of notes to be presented alongside Wallace's. The next thing that happened, of course, was it galvanized Darwin into scribble, scribble, scribble. The Origin of Species, published in November 1859, does mention Wallace in the preface, but it's my theory. This is, here it is. And look, to a certain extent, fair enough. You know, he's been working on this for a long time. Does Wallace go through and count the number of times he's referred to? Does Wallace get resent? Excuse me? No. Wallace loves the book, says, no, no, God, look, Darwin knows so much. I couldn't have done this. I suppose um, I hate sort of injustice and I feel that at the moment the history of biology has a very Darwinocentric uh, view. People like Wallace actually made massive um, contributions and they deserve to be remembered as well. It's the greatness of the idea that they had which should give him prominence, which is this idea that everyone's been seeking forever. Where we come from and how we relate to the rest of the natural world.